want to get things started uh, with a question we were talking backstage about, which is that th this is a, a topic nobody really has great answers to, but uh, maybe we can start by thinking about what are the right questions here that, that people should be focusing on that, uh, th that, that should shape the discussion that we're having when it comes to intellectual property in the, in the current moment. So, uh, Pierre, do you want to start with that? Uh, yes, but um, as you know, we are talking, my focus is based on data, and uh, it's very difficult, perhaps more than in the music business, to know exactly uh, which owns what. Uh, but it will be fundamental to have the answer, not today perhaps, but in the next few months and years. In 2014, the data-based economy represented 1.87% of the GDP of Europe. In 2020, it will be 3.17%, uh, more than double. So over the last 20 years, Europe has tried to keep up with developments uh, through its uh, regulation, uh, copyright, uh, ownership rights, intellectual property, property rights uh, for technology, but very often uh, they've been left behind. Clearly, in 2001, there was a directive, a European directive, that provided harmonization of uh, uh, intellectual property rights uh, in the information society. Uh, but that it's not enough today. You can't be satisfied with uh, the rights which uh, are of interest to an individual company. Um, I think the huge revelation began in 2011 during the Obama administration when that administration decided to open uh, all data of the American uh, administration. One of the uh, corporate uh, collaborators of your Cross, president at the time, Alan Cross, who is a uh, candidate for elections in Maryland, said that this open, opening uh, by uh, the American uh, uh, government will be followed by the rest of the world so that we create a new public service a new economy, a new general uh, service for the public, and that's what we're going through now, because France in 2013 and 2014 responded to that uh, under um, uh, François Hollande, who spoke about that on Tuesday, and we have a new economy which was has been born from these trillions of uh, administrative and government data. Um, they've enabled companies to do business, but when uh, it comes to who owns what, well, the question is more difficult than ever. So, so uh, if you would propose, what, what, did it, what is it that you would say to people they should talk about, they should think about to shape this uh, thinking here? What, what's the, what is it that we're not uh, thinking, what is it that we're not thinking about when it comes to intellectual property that actually you, uh, given the, what you just laid out, sa uh, says, okay, this is this is the question to actually focus on. Yes, because uh, until today, uh, up until today, Europe has been saying, you are the owner of your data when the uh, authorship rights, copyright, is original, when you were the creator of the database, and the constitution of the database needed substantial investment and added value from your company. Now, up to that point, it's easy. But the moment that the whole of data uh, which interests, uh, is of interest to the uh, administration for all uh, cities, for all countries in Europe, in uh, um, uh, United States and countries throughout the world, and now that 
uh, uh, companies themselves have to form part of that dynamic. All observers are going to be able to use that data. They're going to be able to cross-reference them. Uh, they are going to be able to give them to scientists. This means that uh, we're going to have to uh, create new uses, and that's going to create new data. Now, who's going to be the owner of that? That's the big question. Panas, what about you? What, what is it that we... Uh, what are the questions here that, that you think are, are really where the discussion needs to be centered? Well, for me, it's around the concept of uh, are, are we applying uh, rules from a physical world onto a digital realm? Many of the frameworks that we're using to operate today, whether they're legislative or otherwise, or even constructs of ownership, um, they are still based on an analog world. So ownership when it comes to, let's say, that chair is easy, right? You, you always know who, who owns that chair or this table. Um, but when it comes to the digital realm, where um, things are not only shared, but also easily added on, right? And bundled and unbundled and atomized, then I don't believe that we are we currently have the right frameworks through which to interpret that. Um, we don't even have the right analogies to use as a society because we've evolved over uh, you know, several thousand years in a physical world. It's the first time that as humans we're experiencing an issue where we don't even have quite the vocabulary, if you will, to um, uh, to use to address these these changes and and what were once traditionally fixed terms are now becoming a lot more fluid uh, I mean I'll take my domain from from the music industry um, who who is a creator today right who who is an owner if I am a composer and I wrote a song and I put it out there and I recorded it and somebody is taking uh, some of my lyric or a guitar lick or a drum loop, bringing something else uh, into it, right. mashing it up, putting it out there on social media, and then somebody else takes it, puts it on a video that then they shared with a bunch of their friends. Who, who is the owner of this? Who, who should profit from it? Is it, um, is it me, the original creator? Is it the, the distributor? So is it, in, in my last example, is it, is it YouTube? Um, but then also, as, as, as humans, we emit every, every second um, data that is growing faster than the rate of an explosion of an atomic bomb, right? Um, I just don't believe that we yet have either the language or the frameworks um, uh, to basically be able to ask, answer questions, let alone even uh, ask the right questions um, just yet. I, I wonder, I feel like it's been 20 years at least since we've been having this conversation about how uh, th the copyright issue, the intellectual property issue would actually lead to less being produced. Uh, the peop that, that creators, that artists would decide to uh, turn away from the marketplace because they were not getting compensated well enough for it but that doesn't seem to be what has happened at all. It's the reverse. And so uh, how much of this is an academic discussion that we just have and how much of it is uh, th 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 that there are, are, are real things that could actually shape the way that this goes because we don't have any lack of content, even if you don't account for uh, every utterance out of each of our mouths <laughs> every day. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think we tend to confuse ownership with professionalism. And it's, it's two different things, right? In, in the media space or the, the film or music space, these constructs of copyright that were put in place once to protect um, content creators, I think one of the questions is, are they still valid? Is, is, a, is a creator today still motivated by the mere need to derive a profit or is there something else? So all of us right now are willfully sharing information through 
dozens of social media channels, but we don't quite ask ourselves, well, who is the owner and should I get paid a fraction of a penny of the several billion dollars of advertising that is uh, sold against the content that I'm, I'm producing? Uh, my, my personal feeling is that there's something deeper when it comes to this desire to communicate and, and to create than just the mere desire to generate a profit. And I think we forget that humankind produced content for thousands of years before the idea of copyright right. was ever enacted, right? Um, being of Greek background, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that any of, of, the, of, uh, <laughs> of the Greek philosophers or playwrights or poets or others, uh, I don't think Homer ever saw a penny. Uh, but what he wrote uh, has, has been around for several thousand years. So I think there's something deeper than pure a profit motive that compels us as people to want to share. And I will say, and, and to, to finish, I, I believe it's more about attribution than it is about um, profit that is motivating people. Pierre, what do you make of that? Um, when you talk about music and film, because I'm the chair of uh, the Cannes Festival, copyright is still valid when it comes to notion and defending uh, authors' rights. Uh, music has had to deal with streaming, mashups, and uh, everything else that Panos has just mentioned. When you open up data, uh, government data and private data, I think that all aspects of uh, the economy and industry are going to be affected in all countries of the world. And that's going to create new business. But when you talk about uh, music, songs, if I create an algorithm which uh, allows me to cross France, to cross France, to stop in uh, a, a city where a... Um, uh, for example, where um, uh, a film is uh, a film, for example, Dunkirk, uh, done by uh, Nolan, and then I use uh, songs because a creator lived in that city. You can create a, a, an algorithm that can bring together all of these film and uh, uh, film and uh, and uh, music at the same time, and it's going to be culturally very important, and the copyright remains in the hands of Nolan, it's his film, but nevertheless it creates a cultural voyage through France uh, by using this algorithm. Uh, when you have this open data, you, uh, I think, are going to go more towards, uh, you're going to move away from copyright. So, uh, what is the role then of... Uh, uh, you were referring to social media companies like Facebook and uh, Twitter, obviously, whatever people are putting on there and whether it's theirs. But it's beyond that. Uh, I, I wonder when you think about music companies, film companies, what is the role that they have in shaping this uh, discussion? Do they? Uh, is it about changing the compensation model? Is it about changing uh, the interactions that they're having with governments? How does that part of it play in? I mean, I think the question is, um, what is the role that, say, um, a traditional record label plays in this new domain? And the truth is, I'm, I'm not sure if they can answer that, that question. I mean, traditional... But what are the possible answers to that question? For me right now, it's primarily um, uh, the equivalent of a venture capital model. Somebody ultimately needs to fund and incentivize new talent to, to create. Um, and then I also believe that they have a, uh, a moral role to play in, in, in helping the artists protect what they're ultimately, um, ultimately generating. Uh, so do you they want mor morality practiced by companies here? That <laughs> <are>. <laughs> what, what, a, what a noble idea, right? Um, but I, again, we... we we forget that these constructs that we call film studios or record labels are byproducts of a very different era. 
where the means of production were extremely expensive, the means of distribution were uh, were almost impossible right. um, to to get. But again, we need to ask ourselves: Are they are they valid now in a world where I am able to create and produce something and distribute something for nearly nothing? The question is: Is what I'm producing valuable? And who is determining that? You know, I, I, I have a lot of argument uh, sometimes with people outside of the music industry because they tend to criticize musicians for willfully uh, sharing their creation for free. And then I turned the question and I said, well, are you on Facebook? Are you on Twitter? Are you on Instagram? Uh, you willfully put out all your uh, photos and, and, and streams and just about anything else you produce for free and somehow you're not thinking that you deserve compensation. So what is the difference between what you're doing and what a musician is doing? What would, the, would those people have a musician do? Excuse me. What would those people have a musician do, uh, just to only uh, put out? Well, I think there, there, there tends to be the, to the, to the, store to buy. the desire to shift the onus onto the creator right. and say that it's up to the creator to assess their rights. Which, by the way, I tend to agree. But again, we also have to ask ourselves: Well, who is a creator today? We're we're witnessing the amateurization to some degree um, of a, a lot of former um, uh, professions, right? A hundred years ago, you had to be a professional photographer to take a photo. And up until 20 years ago, an overwhelming amount of the photos that were uh, in publications and, and otherwise that were consumed were, were done by professionals. Today, I think, I'm, I could be wrong in this number, but it's, it's under 10%, if not, if not less. Mm -hmm. I think we're beginning to see the same thing happening in other forms of, of creative media, in, in, including music, where you no longer need to be an instrumentalist virtuoso right. to be able to make music. And, and I guess, the, you know, the answer, the, the, the question ought to be, well, why should you be? Uh, why, why not enable anybody to, to create? And ultimately, does creativity not benefit from enabling more people to engage in it? Si vous le voulez bien, je voudrais quitter le, uh, I want to leave the cultural aspect and move back to what, to me, trois, because I'm the older uh, of us three, by a long way, is the revolution, which, like, the likes of which I've never seen. All governments uh, are giving all uh, data to the, those people who have the imagination to use it. Um, I've talked with uh, some of my colleagues um, uh, about the capacity through administrative and government d data and with the work with scientists, uh, with uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, in a few months, one could uh, assess the uh, level of renovation of all of the buildings in Paris, and you could assess just how um, uh, how long it would take to restore all of those buildings in Paris. Can you imagine um, how important that would be for um, uh, Paris if you were able to uh, create more work sites, uh, more control, more use of energy by using that uh, capacity? That predictive capacity um, perhaps requires a patent and perhaps it's going to be uh, valid for a, no a certain number of cities of a certain si uh, size, and it could be um, the subject of a European uh, um, a patent. Uh, now, the algorithm, uh, the, the idea of predicting what you are going to create in the near future is going to be a new form of economy. You mentioned artificial intelligence, and I wonder how that then uh, plays into this conversation, and what what do we do with that question? What 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 happens if there is a song that is produced uh, by not a human being uh, but a, a computer program? What if uh, we've had this conversation in our newsroom? What if there are articles that are produced by uh, by artificial intelligence? Which what there are now. Th there are, and what if it? Well, so far they're not very complicated. What if they, we were we were wondering whether there would be. Uh, 
journalists like to think of themselves as uh, doing something that it, uh, nobody else can pull off all the time. And so, <laughs> um, uh, what if there are uh, longer articles, more complicated articles? What if there are uh, uh, some some movie uh, uh, work that's being done that way? How, wh what does that do to this conversation? It's very complicated. If, if you have a machine who is able to compose uh, a song like Radiohead, is it a Radiohead song because they were the inspirators? But is, if it is a real original music, that's the question. I have not the answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there, there's a company in, in America called Amper that... Um, basically is able to take any piece of short form video and it can interpret from the video movement um, scenery and then you can decide well I'm looking for some orchestral music or uh, I want some symphonic rock and then I'm oversimplifying it but basically in a matter of a few seconds it can generate a whole new piece of music that matches to to the movement and the tone and the scenery of that particular video. Um, Which is not drawing on, to use Pierre's it, it's, example, it's Radiohead or No, no, it's, or it's, not, it, or it's not necessarily inspired by any particular artist, but it is done so by crunching a huge amount of data, and then it says, this is what I think the music ought to be. Who, who owns that? I mean, presumably it's original every single time, but it is also crunching a bunch of data that was emitted by a number of other a number of other creators. Or to Pierre's point, we were talking earlier about this concept, right? I mean, there's there's apps on our phone that say, you know, make my children's photo look like Rembrandt, <laughs> right? I mean, he's not alive, so he's not here to say, wait a minute, that's infringement. <laughs> but what if I take any song that I compose and said, make it sound like Radiohead or Depeche Mode, and to any ear, that is instantly recognizable as a as that sonic identity of that. And so what do you do who, in that case? Who owns it? I, I, don't, I don't know if I personally have an answer. My, my, my <laughs> me. If, 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 if you were to put me on the spot, I'd say that um, both own it. Both the new creator who's adding something to it as well as the original uh, inspiration point, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know... I mean, our phone is sold to us as a, one singular piece of equipment, but it's comprised of a number of other independent parts. Right. And somehow, you don't care who pays all the manufacturers of all these components. You just buy a phone. But whether it's algorithms or any number of other constructs enable payments to be channeled to all the individual component manufacturers that were responsible for bringing this phone to life and all the workers and so forth and so on, this entire supply chain, if you will. I say, why can't we recreate a similar approach mm -hmm. in a digital world where using technologies, and my next panel is about blockchain technology, if you can identify origin, and I think that's what our focus ought to be, then why are we obsessed with having only one owner of something? Yeah. Why couldn't there be multiple owners, or when it comes to other information like our, our medical data or our biometric data, um, I also think that it's not just about who's generating the data, but it's also who is interpreting and serving the Absolutely. data and what one is, is doing with it. We should also create a framework that we should say, if this is for the general good, then we should create a separate construct for that. So I've had my DNA analyzed and by 23andMe. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if during the process I've sat back and questioned, huh, I wonder what they do with all this information that I'm giving them, right? But on the other hand, I also get Presumably information. Presumably they're doing something with it. Yeah. Now, look, if, if, if they're selling my DNA to, you know, Match.com <laughs> um, to recommend new partners, I would probably have an issue with it, right? Um, but on the other hand, if they're using it for scientific research to come back and tell me, you know, my chances of developing Alzheimer's by the time I'm 80 are minuscule or they're great. Right. And, and we are 
by extent using data to ha help society, then I'm okay with it. What I think is not happening, however, is inserting us into these conversations. We, we're not conscious yet of the way that our data is being used, so we don't have an option of saying, this use is okay, and this other use is, is not. So to me, that's what I'd like us to see. As a creator of information, whether it's creative content, a musician, or whether it's me as an individual giving my data wittingly or unwittingly, I think that I should be able to have more control of what happens to my data, but create frameworks that can, that is not a one size fits all approach. Too much excessive uh, emphasis on privacy, I think may rob humanity of advances that we can have in the, in, in, in the short or, or long term future with respect to disease identification or crime prevention or other, or other issues or in education, right? But on the other hand, if we don't have these conversations, we're, uh, I'm afraid that we will be surrendering um, our, our identity um, uh, to situations that we're not quite aware of and that could be used for oppression in other situations. W one day you, have to, uh, you will have to ask to your doctor to pay you a copyright on your DNA. <laughs> <laughs> right now I'm paying for them. <laughs> I have twins. So, you know, uh, identical twins. So I don't know who, what ownership means there. <laughs> who owns what? It's changing your whole perspective on all of this. Yes. Here, we don't have a lot of time. I just wanted to uh, get your perspective on, on the question that Panos raised about the, a program that writes, you, you raised the question if, it's, if it sounds like Radiohead, but what if it is something that, is, that doesn't uh, have a relation to existing music or an existing film? It's something that is created f uh, from scratch uh, by a computer program. Who owns that? I have, I have not already the answer. We, we ask ourselves a question at the last, during the last uh, Cannes Festival, because the Mexican director, uh, Gustavo Inaritu, proposed a, a virtual reality movie, uh, which was a big, big installation, and it was a, a short movies. Um, it was a night at the frontier uh, between Mexico and uh, USA. Okay. It was something virtual. It was not exactly a scenario. It was virtual reality. I think uh, the next weekend, Inaritu will receive uh, an uh, Oscar donor uh, in, in Hollywood, but he's not really the creator. So he has not really the copyright, but he will have the Oscar. Well, right, well, we, I know we we're out of time, just very quickly. Yeah. Um, we're already making music using machines, right? I mean, synthesizers have been around since right. the 70s. <laughs> um, and, and somehow, I don't think we're struggling, you know, if I'm using a synthesizer, who's the owner of that? Um, so, you know, I'm an optimist. I think we'll evolve and get there, but we should absolutely start by pushing our governments and pushing our societies and pushing our educational institutions and pushing the companies that own the data um, to at least have these, have these debates and these discussions. All right, a hand for our panel. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.